Welcome to the local campaign here on Rogers TV. Thank you so much for joining us. As we get closer to Election Day, October 24th, we turn our attention to municipal debates. Today's debate is with Ward 15, Kitchissippi Ward. And before I introduce you to our candidates, I'll go over the format for all of you at home and for our candidates here in studio. We begin with our opening statements. Each candidate will have 60 seconds for their opening statement. The order of that was drawn randomly just a few moments ago. Following their opening statement, I will open up the debate portion of this debate. Um, what happens there is I will be asking a candidate a question. They will have 45 seconds to open up the discussion and then I open the floor to all candidates and I certainly encourage all of our candidates to jump in. Feel free to jump in whenever you feel that you want to get your opinion in there. After that portion of the debate is done, I go back to the candidate with whom I originally asked the question and they will have 30 seconds to wrap up on that topic. We'll go through some of the major topics, of course, um, that are important to constituents in the ward and of course residents across the city. Once the debate portion is done, we move on to our closing statements and each of our candidates will have 60 seconds for that and we will do that in reverse order. So now that we know the format, let's introduce you to our candidates. First we have Dan Stringer. Dan, welcome. Thank you. Jeff Leeper, welcome Jeff. Thanks. And Una Fitzgerald, welcome Una. Thank you all for being here. Really appreciate your time today. As I said, we're going to begin with opening statements. Dan, we start with you. You have 60 seconds. Hi, thanks a lot. And uh, welcome to the debates here in Kitsissippi. Um, uh, my name is Dan Stringer. I'm a community builder. I have a long record of activism in Kitsissippi. Founded the uh, McKellar Heights uh, Community Association, the Island Park Towers uh, Tennis Association. The issues I'm most concerned about are your issues. They are densification and the LRT. But I'm also very concerned about the the taxes, we pay too many taxes in Kitsissippi, and I will not vote for any budget that goes beyond a 2% increase over the previous uh, budget. Um, uh, intensification, densification as I call it, I, I want to stick a pin in that bubble and uh, challenge the very philosophy of intensification as being absolutely deleterious, bad, for Kitsissippi. Okay, thank you very much, Dan. Jeff, over to you. You have 60 seconds for your opening statement. Hi, Kitsissippi. Uh, first, I would like to acknowledge that we are on the unsurrendered and uh, uh, unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg. Uh, for eight years, it's been my privilege to serve as your thoughtful and independent and hardworking advocate at City Hall. I'm proud of the things that we've accomplished together. There's more traffic common. We've put more money into our community partners. There's more money for housing. We've built new uh, parks and green spaces through the ward. We've supported intensification where that makes sense for our ward. We've battled intensification that doesn't make sense. And we've put new limits on infill. You've known me to be present and communicative through emergencies as when we were flooded, when the power's gone out, when we were held hostage by hateful people, and through a pandemic that has been world changing. There's a lot of work I'd like to continue working on in the next term of council on transportation, the climate, and planning. And I'm looking forward to chatting more with you today about how we'll accomplish that. Thank you very much, Jeff. Over to Una. Una, you have 60 seconds for your opening statement. Thank you, Derek. I acknowledge we are meeting on the unceded traditional territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. I'm running for councillor because I've lived in Kitchissippi for 30 years and want to serve the residents by bringing my knowledge of good governance and sustainable development to the local level to improve, improve the functioning of city council and to create the world-class capital city that Ottawans deserve. I'm a bilingual lawyer with an MBA who has worked with the, as a senior leader and lawyer on the, in the federal public service and at an international think tank. I've also taught at local universities and volunteered in leadership roles at several national and local not-for-profit organizations. I'm an experienced in guiding and leading organizations to make informed decisions and be transparent and accountable to stakeholders and the public. I've also been an advocate working collaboratively at the international, national, and provincial level for climate action, human rights, and other aspects of sustainable development. I commit to bring good governance to city council and to work to create a sustainable, innovative, inclusive all right. city for all. 
Thank you, Una. Thanks to all of our candidates. Uh, that does it for the opening statements. Let's start with our debate portion. And Dan, we start with you. So I'm going to ask you a question. You'll have 45 seconds to open up the discussion. Let's talk with, about one of the biggest files, and that is public transportation. Um, what, would you, what solutions would you bring to the table to help make it more reliable, accessible, and affordable? You have 45 seconds, Dan, to open. And, and I, too, want to acknowledge that we are here on the unceded, unconquered, and unsurrendered uh, territory of the Anishinaabe people. Um, you know, the LRT is a disaster. We took money out of buses to put it into the LRT. The LRT doesn't work, so our buses don't work nearly as well as they used to. Um, first on the LRT, we have a system uh, that is running quite well around the world and we need to find an expert in one of those 15 places around the world and bring them here to get them to identify the problem and then hire them to solve the problem. All right, uh, okay, Dan, that's, uh, that's time for the opening. Uh, I open it up to all candidates. Feel free to jump in. Derek, I think uh, when I'm at the doors, the thing I'm hearing about most with respect to public transit is the, the fares and the convenience. A ward like Kitchissippi that is so compact, public transit should be one of the first things that people choose when they choose to how to get around our city and our ward. But because the fares are so high and because the service is so unreliable, uh, it's not. And I think one of the opportunities we have, especially post-pandemic with changed work patterns, is uh, to rethink how we are providing transit to focus less on bringing people in from far-flung suburbs downtown and more about uh, the local service. In order to keep fares reasonable, we don't have to pump a lot of new money in necessarily. I think one of the keys is going to be to reallocate the resources that are already in the system. And it does seem that the uh, very important issue is to hear the results of the judicial inquiry that has happened into, into the whole question of the LRT. Uh, the testimony we've heard so far has shown us that there's been extremely poor governance, divisiveness on council, cost overruns, waste, delays, lack of transparency and accountability. This is the biggest uh, P P3, public-private um, uh, project that we've done in Ottawa, and it has been a pretty well unmitigated disaster. Even though the intentions may have been good, and it is really important to get good transit in the city. So once we get the judicial inquiry results back, the new council has to do a complete review of what is happening, and I would pick up the point that was that was made by Dan that um, we need to bring the experts. This is not rocket science. There are working LRTs in other parts of the world, including in Canada, and we need to do it better. I'd also pick up the point I, about I, if, if cost I and reliability. Wanna, uh, thank you very much, but I, I, I did want to jump in and challenge uh, uh, Jeff on saying that the service. Uh, that you are an independent on council. I, I, I don't see it that way. I think you, you belong to a little clique, one of whom is running for mayor. And I think your involvement uh, over the last four years on council has been very much guided by that mayoral uh, bid. Uh, but as far as the service being unreliable, don't you sit on the committee responsible for buses? Uh, no. But you used so the uh, the transit commission is the uh, the the party that looks after buses, and I've been fairly clear. I've voted against multiple budgets now that are increasing fares to the point where many people don't want to take the service anymore. I think what we have is the opportunity under a new mayor, whoever that is, and a brand new city council to rethink our approach to fares and how the whole system is structured. I'm looking but, forward but to Jeff, doing we, that. We I mean, used to sit on that committee, uh, and things have not just like uh, to say improved that we, while you we were really, on it or before. Go ahead, Ona. Uh, there's two points I'd like to make. First of all, uh, it's not just a question of fares. The fares are an issue, and we need to rethink the whole issue of public transit, given what's happened after the pandemic and new patterns of behavior for workers and commuters. That is definitely something we need to do. That means that the whole project has to be reconsidered. And in that regard, I'm very concerned that we do not want this councillor being involved because you admitted in the Narwhal that you actually had to, you did vote, I understand that there were pressure put on you, but you voted in favour of the extension for $4.66 billion. 
with, with all the problems that we've seen, there was so much litigation going on right now with respect to this um, with the LRT. Well, and let's we really let's let Jeff um, answer to that and then we, we'll wrap up here with Dan. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, so there is a lot of litigation. Uh, Council in 20, um, uh, before 2014 gave this contract to a company that promised it could deliver the product it said it would at a price that we set. Uh, it hasn't been able to deliver that. And I'm uh, pleased to see with respect to Council that we've been unanimous in pursuing that through the courts. The ultimate outcome may be exiting from that um, uh, contract. I'm, I'm sorry, Jeff, that we're out of time. Dan, you have 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. Well, uh, the interim report from the province said the city of Ottawa takes credit for everything that went right and no responsibility for everything that went wrong. And that reminds me of, of Jeff Leeper. I mean, uh, why was the second... Uh, leg of the LRT that you voted for, why was the contract given to the same people that botched up the first uh, leg of the LRT? That's what um, my people are asking, okay. shall ask me Sorry, at the door. Dan. Sorry, Dan, we're out of time here. Um, I move to Jeff for the next topic. Jeff, you'll have 45 seconds to open this up. Um, I, I believe Dan touched on this in his opening statement. Has the city become too responsive to developers and not doing enough to respect the wishes of residents? Um, Jeff, you have 45 seconds to open up the discussion. Absolutely, uh, Derek, and thanks for the question. Development in Kitchissippi is always a hot-button topic. Um, the developer influence in the ward is uh, is extremely strong and right across the city. I think the, the entire thrust towards exacerbating urban sprawl, building further and further into the suburbs that hurts the environment and that hurts taxpayers is something in our official plan that is entirely developer-driven. Uh, and it's one of the reasons why I voted against it. I'm not taking developers as I did not, uh, not taking donations as I did not in 2014 and again in 2018 from people who I can ascertain are part of the development industry. I have worked hard to maintain my independence from the builders in Ottawa and I will continue to do so. All right, so we'll open up the discussion to well, all candidates. I'm, I, I'm not taking money from any uh, developers either. I, I think that's a pretty low bar. Uh, the I fact have, Neither the, am I. <laughs> We're all advertising that, so it's an extremely low bar. The fact of the matter is the LRT is down and the high rises keep going up. They're like weeds. Everywhere you turn, it's not that you see construction going on. As you see those wonderful city signs with uh, the pretty uh, blue on it that says there's another building going up. And who knows what's being planned that they don't have a sign for. Yet there's a whole block within walking distance of uh, my apartment building. And I'm not in favor of tearing down existing apartment buildings. I do live in one. I just think that we should be building the apartment buildings that we need, if we need them, outside of Kitsissippi. We paid the, our dues for intensification, and it's time for other um, wards to step and up. That, uh, I'd like that, to say that residents are concerned in this ward about affordability, affordable housing, and addressing climate change. They support infill and intensification. When I go door to door, they do, but they're not happy with how it's being done. They feel under siege. There's a lack of transparency, inconsiderate, loud, destructive, disruptive construction. But what we need is more affordable housing, and this could, in fact, be um, this pro this pro. Pro project of intensification could be a driver of sustainability and inclusion if done right. If elected, I'd like to see community service standards for builders. Exa example, timely notifications, clear timelines, mitigation of noise and disruption. And two, sustainable performance standards for builders. Using sustainable design and materials, green roofs, porous lanes, preserving mature trees, and, and planting new trees. And to the well, the city council, should incentivize corporations may, and developers um, involved well, in let, let somebody yeah, else yeah, There's jump a lot in of here, points please. here to, um, uh, <laughs> to your point. We actually just uh, uh, passed nearly unanimously uh, new high performance development standards for, uh, for building in Ottawa that are essentially our version of a green building code. Uh, the, the new infill rules leave much more room for but Jeff, planting. Under, under your uh, watch, uh, high rise uh, construction in this uh, ward has gone through the roof. And that's what the official plan calls for. It's, well, it's so not what? an individual councillor's uh, No, but, but to you're the one guy that we elect from Kitsissippi. You're the only one from Kitsissippi who sits on council. And one of what the are you I've doing done, to yes. defend our rights? So one of the things that I have done is our official plan calls for this kind of intensification near transit stations, but I think what we've all kind of recognized is that it's not equally distributed across the city, which is one of 
the main reasons why I voted against our new official plan is because okay, I don't Jeff, believe I'm going to let Ona in jump back in here because you'll have I'd, a chance to wrap. Yes, I'd like to suggest that the city should incentivize corporations and developers involved in city business to adhere, to adhere to standards of good corporate citizenship. And this could include developing enforceable impact benefit agreements with residents to gain the license to operate and expedite approvals. These IBAs could address construction service standards, sustainable construction, contributions to community gardens, recreational facility, facilities, dog parks, accessible children's parks, and et cetera. We'll, we'll let Dan jump in and, and, and Jeff, Jeff, you can. Um, uh, as right. I've noted, we need to spread out uh, the wards that take on intensification, even though I think it's a, it's a wrap deal. Uh, densification is, is, a, is, a, is bad news for Ottawa, but not only if they are on the LRT, but also if they're on a bus line that leads to the LRT. That should qualify for high-rises high as well. And, and they do. Uh, when you take a look at the but they applications don't that, that are coming happen. forward, it does. If you take a look oh, at the very, oh, applications yes. that are coming forward right across the city, our transportation master plan has um, high, um, uh, high priority bus routes. So you have an uh, extra 30 seconds yeah. here, Jeff. Uh, and so throughout the city, uh, you're seeing intensification on those uh, rapid transit routes. I think there's an application for the, uh, for the Lone Star right now uh, where there won't be LRT, but there will be bus rapid transit that brings people to transit transit stations. The, um, what uh, Una has been asking for is something that this council has already been doing. It's within the purview of the province, but we have community benefits charges, we have cash in lieu of parkland, and new infrastructure is built with development charges. All of this is heavily constrained by the province, but it is all making all a right, difference in you, our Jeff. ward Sorry, today. Sorry, that is time. Una, we move on to you uh, for the next topic, and I believe you've touched on it already, but let's talk climate change and the environment. It's uh, been a big talking point, big topic for many uh, in this campaign so so far, what solutions do you think the city as a municipality can do to help combat climate change? Well, change starts locally, and so the city can do a lot and it can enable its residents to do more, and they would like to do it. I hear concern about climate change from almost every person I meet, um, concern about loss of tree cover, heat islands, dangerous weather causing failure of electrical grids, um, ensuring a healthy life for our children and for their, their children. Um, I've been studying the city plan on climate action and asking many questions. Is it sufficiently ambitious? Are there more ways to engage and incentivize residents to take climate action individually and collectively? Because I know they want to do that. How can residents participate? How can landlords, tenants, homeowners, schools and communities all participate? How do we most effectively divide... F divide All right, sorry, Una, that's, that's your opening. Okay. Uh, Candidates, feel free to jump in here. Uh, Una, you say change starts locally. I, w I want to tell you that I was reading your CV and it left me speechless, without words. Not one word about your community involvement and volunteer work in Kitsissippi. How can you talk and say change starts locally when you're not involved locally? Dan, I think the, the question was about uh, how the yeah, uh, city can encourage, uh, uh, encourage a stronger response to uh, climate change. Go ahead. And certainly, um, Go ahead, you know, uh, you've also been absent from civic life for a very long time. The, oh, uh, Jeff, key, that's just not true. I think the key thing I've been act, I've been active for at least can the last 35 years. Can the topic of climate yeah. change? This is such an important topic. So I think and I agree. First thing of all, I would just to, just to answer your point, Dan, um, it's true. I have not been very much involved in local politics. I am new to local politics. I've been nonpartisan all my life, and I have worked on issues of climate change at the international le level, the national level, and the provincial level. And I want to bring those ideas to the city. So if I may, uh, I think the most um, important thing to keep in mind is what the role of the municipality is in addressing climate change. We're creatures of the province, there are powers that are given to us. And we have a really significant role to play in addressing uh, greenhouse gas emissions because we have that immediate control of two key things, land use planning and transportation. Intensification and public transit have to work hand in hand in order to reduce the number of greenhouse gases in our city. We need to have an electrified transit fleet that transit fleet has to be a first choice for people to use to get around the city. And we have to have 15 minute communities that are more mixed use, where density is more evenly distributed across the city in order to encourage people to drive fewer kilometers. Greenhouse, it takes 500 trees 
to offset the greenhouse gas emissions emitted by a single Canadian driver uh, right now. All right, Jeff, I'm just going to yep. let Dan, Dan, did you want to jump in and, and well, talk well, about Well, certainly. I, I think we need a burn, for instance, uh, along the uh, Sir Johnny McDonald Parkway uh, across from the Selby floodplain because we need to start protecting ourselves about the disastrous effects of, of, of climate that can be coming upon us as they do uh, in other places of the world and the country without notice. Um, I'm, a, I'm a green activist. I've been cleaning up the shoreline of the Ottawa River for the last 15 years, as Jeff knows very well. Uh, as an aside, Jeff, I've been very active in human rights in, in the city for the last 15 years. Uh, and it's, it would be and nice to see you involved every, every now and then. Uh, Okay, Dan, uh, Una, yeah. do you want to jump in well, here? Well, just on the issue, since you raised the issue of human rights, we recently had the UN General Assembly say that, declare that the right to a healthy environment is a human right. And I feel that this is something that the City of Ottawa should be taking very seriously. Climate action should be at the centre of all decision making in the city. The LRT is there for no other reason than to help support us in that path towards climate action. Una, you're going to have uh, a chance yeah. to wrap up, so I'll let Jeff and Dan jump in here. Yeah, so I've been cleaning up the shoreline of the Ottawa River for the last 15 years, especially at Westboro Beach, and uh, Una, I've never seen you there once. So public transit, uh, moving people around and reducing the number of kilometers that every uh, person in the city drives is really the city's most important response to climate change. Intensification is a part of that. 15-minute communities are a part of that. We need to build safe cycling infrastructure. We need to build transit networks. We need to have fares that are affordable for people. We need to have transit service that is convenient. That's how we're going to reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that come from the city with the powers that the city actually has. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And candidates, Una, you have 30 seconds to wrap. One of the problems that has been touched on by people here is that we do see a divided city in Ottawa. And that is because Council has behaved in a divided fashion. They've broken into factions and they have not been working together. We need climate action at the whole city level. And that would address some of the commuter problems that people are talking about. We need to divide our efforts between adaptation and mitigation. We must do both. We need to be a world-class leader in this area. We need to show direction to the rest of Canada. All right, thank you very much, candidates. We move on to the next topic. Dan, I'll start with you with this topic. Let's talk policing. Um, we've heard from different candidates about the idea of perhaps freezing the police budget. Some want to raise the police budget. Some want to reallocate some of that money to other agencies funded by the municipality. What are your thoughts on that? You have 45 seconds to open, Dan. The essential issue with the police is not budget. It's, it's their training and their sensitivity to issues that weren't uh, police issues, perhaps. Uh, well, they were police issues 50 years ago, but um, people weren't talking about them as much. So we need to train our police officers to be sensitive to mental illness and to know how to react when they're dealing with an individual who very well, who is acting like they're mentally ill. We need to sensitize our police to racial issues, especially uh, um, black hatred and uh, we haven't done a good job on that. I do not believe in defunding the police. In fact, I believe in giving them more money to address exactly those okay, issues. Okay, thank you. I open it up to all candidates. Here. I do think I, I need to take um, a disagree and, and disagree very clearly with uh, uh, Dan's assertion that police should be trained differently in order to deal with some of the um, issues that they're responding to. We know that within the police budget, we're allocating too many of those resources to police officers responding to calls that they should not be responding to, to calls that they don't want to be responding to that stem from mental health and addictions. Having a police officer respond to mental health and addictions calls is an extraordinarily expensive way. And with the culture within policing, it's also not uh, the most sensitive way to respond to those calls. We do but Jeff, we don't disagree. You're, you're, uh, we don't disagree. Agree on that. Sorry, Dan, what I heard you say is that we should be training police in order to be able to respond to some of those social issues. That's what and I that's, said. I th that's I think not one of the what things, we should be doing. One of the things we've really seen uh, because of the convoy, and I've also heard from residents who are police uh, in this community, is there's a failure of leadership 
in the police force and that there are leadership challenges and that is also because of there are problems within the force these need to be addressed there, there's all kinds we've seen evidence of it over the years that there have been issues about uh, the treatment of racialized communities treatment of disadvantaged people people with mental mental um, and crises the, and the treatment of the but first we, black we, police chief in the city of we, Ottawa. We so no point scapegoating the first black police chief in the city of Ottawa, which is what I'm hearing from you now. I'm certainly not doing that. I'm saying the fact that there has been a failure of leadership over this period. Well, and what we <laughs> and one of the things we've also seen is this is a problem across any kind of paramilitary and policing that they are also being influenced. The 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 rank and file file are being influenced, like many citizens are, by disinformation. That caused a lot of problems with the, the convoy. And, you know, we've seen it with the, the, the military as well. They had some issues with that. And we've seen it in the police. So, so there's a challenge for the police. They need to address these issues. So we need stronger leadership. All right, go if ahead, I Jeff. may, I think one of the challenges, and something I've said publicly, is that uh, the mayor, whoever that is, needs to take their seat on the police services board. For the last eight years, our mayor has not taken their seat on the police services board, and the leadership challenges that stem from that, when city council takes a handoff approach through its mayor to the police services board, is, is not healthy to have good uh, policing. Uh, I've joined the police services board in the past six months or so, and uh, one of the things that I can say say is that uh, the Police Services Board is a, is a great opportunity to try to influence um, where the police are going. I've been a steady voice for trying to reallocate some of those resources that are currently put into inappropriate response to mental health and addictions issues into an appropriate community response that is more effective. I've had the opportunity to be very vocal about times when I've seen and Jeff, the let police me reiterate, are not I agree with that position. Uh, so, um, one, one of the um, the other issues that we've seen um, with the police is that they are uh, not having as much positive impact in the community as they would like to have. That they're being pulled to sort of working more back room and not working in the community. Now that is, that is something that would also help improve relations between different communities if there was more on the street participation of policing. And that's that's just a new approach that has to be reinstated. Again, I was uh, I was on the ground when um, uh, Abdirahman Abdi uh, was uh, killed by police, and and having more police on the ground is not uniformly seen as a as a as a positive measure to take. What many of us want is for police to focus on issues of criminality. Uh, we want them to be focused on the B and E's. We want them to be focused on the traffic information. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Putting more resources into police in we order to try to address you're right. the okay. mental uh, health and addiction. I, I Thank you, candidates. I'll stop it there, but Dan, you have 30 seconds to wrap well, up. Well, Ona, on I agree with you. We need to go back to community policing. And we lost a lot when we lost community policing. But you know, there's something else we need. And we need an investigation into the allegations of racism within the Ottawa police. They just had that investigation in Toronto, and they found out there was a lot of racism in the police force in Toronto. I'm not saying there is in Ottawa, but we should deal with that allegation. Um, and, and to be clear, yeah, we need to give money to other agencies that okay. can help the police All right, as well. Thank you very much to our candidates. Uh, Jeff, the next question is to you. You'll have 45 seconds to open. Um, there's a growing concern over the city's debt. Where would you set tax increases over the next four years? Taking that into account, you have 45 seconds to open. I think what's clear is that city services are declining. Uh, in the city. Uh, our, our park garbage bins are often overflowing. We can't get bylaw officers out to important calls. And, and service standards are, are suffering as inappropriately low tax increases in the face of inflation have steadily meant eight years, 12 years of austerity budgets. I don't have a tax figure in mind. We know that inflation is running around 5%. Costs to the city are increasing. Costs of our labor are increasing. But one of the things that we have to do in the next term of council, and it's exciting to have this opportunity, is take a look at what should the city be doing? What are the hard choices that we need to make to have a sustainable city? And once we know what we need to do, we need to fund that appropriately. All right, thank you, Jeff. I open it up to all We're candidates here. are all ahead, experiencing Anna. affordability issues. They're, um, they're ready to pay for services for their taxes, but they're seeing that the services are not there. 
This, will be, this issue of taxation will be important and difficult decision for Council. We have to keep costs down while still pro providing the vital services. Where can we save money? How, do you, how, do things, how can we do things more efficiently? Um, are there any uh, environmental and climate related initiatives that would generate savings? And I just want to say that the impact of COVID pan pandemic has not been felt evenly. The most disadvantaged in our community have suffered the most and need help. There is a mental health crisis, there's a homelessness crisis, addiction crisis, people in ODSP are being forced to try to live below the poverty line, Order. community housing is becoming more unsafe, accessibility issues have worsened for many, Order. seniors are struggling to pay increasing taxes and they feel they're being pushed out. Okay, so Una, we need to I, I, I don't Go have, ahead, I didn't, I didn't bring a speech. I don't have a text that I feel I need to read. Um, but Jeff, you, you said, I've heard you say in the past that you would go for a, a tax increase as high as 4.5%. I'm very clear. And, and on a, the way you change the culture of spending and big spending at City Hall is you don't vote for the budget. I'm making a commitment. I will not vote for any budget that increases more than 2% year over year. And that, that will send the bureaucrats back to their desks and uh, trying to find a way to get their 2% increase. So and there's no other way to do it. The bureaucrats control the budget. Go ahead, Jeff. So, so rest assured, uh, what you're proposing is that year after year in the face of inflation, we're going to cut the budget under your plan not to adhere to anything more than 2%. Believe me, city staff have been working under austerity conditions for eight years now. We cannot afford a big now. spending administration. We can't afford not to make investments in the services that we residents need in order to make the city We pay too much taxes in Kitsissippi already. I, well, one proposal that I've heard is that um, having earlier consultation on the budget would help uh, address some of the point idea. that you're saying. That's so you're not simply idea. you're not simply voting at the last minute. You know, no, yay, yay, nay. It would be much better to have more consultation. This is a crisis crisis we're going through. As I say, it's a, th there's a social crisis in our city that we need to address because it affects all of us. It, it, um, you know, it's painful to see what's going on and we need to make this a livable city for everybody. So we've got to be working together on council to figure out solutions. And that means reallocating some money, finding ways to make savings where we can. Right. And right. That's, absolutely. That is, um, uh, that is work that I think a lot of us have been frustrated we haven't been able to do is in a budget that has been very tightly controlled by the mayor uh, who has been able to enforce a, a form of discipline on a majority of council we haven't had the opportunity to have those discussions about what are residents priorities and how are we going to fund them what are well, the well, hard choices we're going to make Jeff, I'm very excited to serve in the next term of council when I hope under a new mayor and with a very different council yeah, we're going to have that Jeff, opportunity Jeff, Jeff, you you You've wrap, been so there ahead, eight Una, years, please. and you've been part, you know, there were two factions. There were two factions, and that's why there was no collaborative working. We need to have a council where there are no factions, where people work together. It's a common problem. We have to address climate change in a common way. We have to address our, our, um, our budget in a common way. So uh, you can't excuse the last eight years. You've got to be part the part of the solution. Every council has to come to the table willing but to Ona, work with the others. You, you must admit that uh, um, economists are telling us that the future is going to be difficult uh, economically and we have to have a council that's prepared to tighten our belt because that's the only way we're going to get through it is by not austerity. I'm, I'm not a slash and burn guy. But as we look at the next four years, we have to be very conscious about keeping the taxes in, in the city of Ottawa low. Well, I totally agree with that. I just wouldn't put a cap on it until we've actually looked at all the numbers, and then we can figure that out. All right, and Jeff, you'll have 30 <coughs> seconds to wrap up on this topic. Yeah, so over the course of the last eight years, I have been uh, very proud to bring the values and the priorities the Kitchissippi residents express to the budget process every year. And, you know, we can talk a lot about collaboration, but ultimately I'm a ward councillor whose job it is to bring up the, the priorities that our residents have. <laughs> In the next term of council, I'm looking forward to a much me. better discussion Thanks, yes. about uh, how we're going to shape those priorities uh, without having um, uh, predetermined right. decisions on the table. All right, thank you very much table. to all Sorry, of you. Derek, uh, right. Next question is over to Una. Una, you'll have 
45 seconds to open up this conversation. In January of 2020, Ottawa City Council unanimously declared homelessness an emergency. We've only seen that situation worsen since. What solutions, what ideas can you bring to the table to help tackle this crisis? Una, you have 45 seconds. Thank you for that really important question. Um, so as I've already mentioned, um, homelessness is a big problem in this city. Uh, the whole question of affordability of housing stretches from those with no homes whatsoever to many, uh, many seniors. So it's a whole spectrum. Ho uh, affordability is a problem for everybody. And the homelessness that we've seen developing over the pandemic has only increased. We need to find ways to give homes to all people in this community. That's the, the, it's hard to get your life together if you do not have a roof, a stable roof over your head. So that should be a first priority, is finding ways to provide stable housing, not just a place where you can sleep for the night, but a place where you can Thank go. Thank you, Una. I'll open it up to all candidates here. Well, public housing is something that the federal government needs to step up on. Uh, and and uh, and they they haven't, and uh, that's uh, a tragedy. And we need to keep pushing the federal government to ante up and give us back the tax dollar, the tax dollars they took away from the people of Ottawa and other cities, and and give it back into so we can do affordable housing. I worked uh, in the front line uh, with the homeless for many years. It's a very complex issue, but Ona is correct. We do need. Uh, the first issue is, is, is housing. Uh, afford affordability is a bigger issue besides just homelessness. And, and the fact is the densification, forcing people into um, basically high-rise apartments, that's the inevitable, that's the uh, end game objective of, of that policy, um, really does not address the issue of uh, of homelessness, of, of housing affordability. In fact, it pushes up the price uh, for young middle-aged families to buy homes. All so right, we Jeff, have to, to look at here? densification Jeff? as an issue here. So yeah, Thank I'd like to speak, I think, to four specific things that are uh, needed that are within the city's purview to do. And I appreciate Dan's um, uh, request to the, to the federal and provincial levels of government for help. We can't do this all on the back of the municipal taxpayer. Our property taxes are simply insufficient to address the scale of the problem. There are four things that I think are uh, critical to implement in the next term of council. Uh, the first of them is a rent bank. A lot of homelessness could be prevented if someone were able to pay next month's uh, rent. Um, the, the difference between losing your tenancy and keeping your tenancy sometimes comes down to a few hundred dollars. I think the municipality could play a role in creating a rent bank. Landlord licensing is going to be critical to ensure that they're upkeeping their properties so that we don't lose affordable housing stock. I think we have to continue work on the land trust, making sure that our not-for-profit partners have a base of land that includes public land and lands that have been acquired by various different levels of government in order to build deeply affordable housing. And we need to continue to invest on our own in capital dollars in uh, investing in affordable housing. Um, I was part of a, a, a team that you know, really put the pressure on to make sure that we restored $15 million in capital funding one to affordable housing. One we of need the more. problems that we're, we're seeing is that the, uh, the development in Kitchissippi is actually closing down places that were homes to people who were uh, economically correct. disadvantaged. And so you see whole areas of Mechanicsville um, and Hintonburg where the, uh, the, uh, every second house is, is either boarded up and has been for years, or there's a pit waiting to be something. And that is forcing more and more people off the street. We, we meet people who are stuck in the worst kind of housing possible, um, in, um, where, where they're actually stuck living in, in a boarding house with others who are drug addicted, and so it feels unsafe and is an unpleasant environment, and they can't get out. The city definitely has to do a lot more to provide more housing, more safe housing for, for okay. all people. Okay, you'll but, have a chance to wrap, so I'll but just you let know, Dan But you know, the housing the city provides already is substandard, and I can tell you that the infestation of bed bugs in most of the... Uh, of the three large buildings uh, run by the city public housing in Kitsissippi Ward is disgusting. 
So and it goes on year after year and uh, election after election, Jeff. I have to give credit to uh, Stéphane Jaguer, who is in charge of Ottawa Community Housing. What you've seen in places like Rochester Field is a wholesale redevelopment of our housing stock to uh, modern, attractive housing. We're going to build a lot more of it as well at Gladstone Village. And uh, the renovation of the housing stock that exists is being helped along by our federal partners, something uh, Dan spoke about in his uh, opening comments on this. And we have to continue to do that. That. Uh, one of the frustrations, of course, on being a city councillor is that things around rent and the relationships between renters and landlords are in the hands of uh, the province. And so with respect to housing loss prevention, our new official plan is pushing the envelope on what we're legally allowed to do, okay, but we thank, need the province you, to step that, up. That does it for the debate portion. Uh, Una, you have 30 seconds to wrap up on this topic. Ottawa Community Housing plays a critical role. I, I totally appreciate appreciate that but they are clearly underfunded because I've I've seen the conditions that many people are living in uh, that are unsupportable they're they're uh, a complete stress on mental health to live in those kinds of conditions and that just exacerbates the problems for everyone neighbors are fighting with neighbors because they're so unhappy in their in their living conditions so we have to give more money to uh, and we we do have to work in partnership thank with the you, federal Anna. government and the thank you very much thanks to all of our candidates we're going to change the format um, this time around. I'm just going to ask a question to each candidate. It'll be the same question. Each of you will have 60 seconds. There is no debate here. It's just 60 seconds for each of you, okay? Um, Dan, I, I will start with you. Let's talk about uh, some of the basics that we hear from a lot of residents, and that is speeding, aggressive driving, stunt driving, safer streets. What solutions can you bring to help cater to those concerns to residents here in Ottawa. Over to you, Dan, for 60 seconds. Yeah, th those are very genuine concerns. Uh, I, I believe that we uh, should be implementing more traffic calming measures. Uh, I know that in the last council, there was some done in some parts of Kitsissippi. There are many areas where nothing has been done. The police should be out ticketing people and uh, um, I, it's it's uh, an issue that of uh, simply paying more attention to it and uh, having uh, r uh, a good response team. But traffic calming is is what are, are the tools that we have. We should implement traffic calming measures far more in uh, in in areas where they haven't been done, and we should have police responding uh, when there are calls for. Uh, people breaking uh, the uh, the law uh, and the Ontario Traffic Act. All right, thank you very much, Dan. Jeff, over to you. Same topic, 60 seconds. Thanks, Derek. And I think many of you watching will have uh, been in touch with uh, Tom in my office, for uh, who has a, a large chunk of his time devoted to traffic calming. You've seen him uh, out on your street measuring the volume and speed of traffic so that we can best prioritize the resources that we have. This term of council, you know, I was successful at getting more money put into that traffic calming budget that councillors have. I hope we are able to continue that. And you've seen more and more traffic calming uh, throughout the ward. In fact, uh, Kitchissippi has a disproportionate share of the uh, the traffic calming and award. I do believe we need to make better use of automated tools. Uh, many of you will recall when I went to Queen's Park to argue in favor of uh, automated speed enforcement. We need to invest in more of those cameras. I think we have to create a culture through enforcement of uh, obeying speed limits. Um, uh, yeah, it is uh, it is obviously one of the key focuses that my office has. We take a customer service approach to it and uh, if your street hasn't been traffic calmed yet, it's going to be. Una, over to you. Thank you, Jeff. Sorry, Una, over to you. 60 seconds, same topic. Thank you. Well, what, uh, traffic calming is great. We, we do need it, except it has an impact. The minute you, tra you calm one street, all the traffic moves to the next street. So it's just making traffic worse on other streets. So what we're seeing is uh, the commuters and, and people living in various areas of Kitchissippi are having to find shortcuts away from all the traffic calming and this is making other neighborhoods more dangerous. So it's a bit of a game of whack-a-mole where we're not really getting on top of it. And I have heard so much from residents about the, uh, the lack of safety on the streets, the, the fears they have for their children walking on the streets or crossing roads like Scott um, the, uh, or crossing Island Park. We've seen all, m the main arteries of this, um, this ward uh, being turned into uh, basically long uh, 
full day parking uh, parking lots where there's traffic jams all day long. Uh, Island Park, which used to be a scenic drive, is now just a, you know right. a parking lot. Thank you very much, Una. Um, same same format here. I'll start with you, Jeff. Sixty seconds again on this for for each candidate. Um, let let's talk more. Uh, let's talk roads again because infrastructure is a big part that that residents talk about all the time. There's roads that need a lot of attention. How do you prioritize those? And more importantly, one of the one of the things issues is is doing that around other infrastructure, scheduling it around other infrastructure. Sixty seconds to you. Yeah, and that's, uh, that's a frustration I hear commonly from residents uh, in the wake of something like a pandemic where the federal uh, government and the provincial government start flooding the, um, uh, the city with money in order to do infrastructure repairs as a form of recovery. It means a lot of projects going on at once. Uh, one of the um, uh, key things that we heard in the last election is that we needed to uh, accelerate the rate at which we are repairing our infrastructure. And uh, it's no surprise that you're seeing more projects on the street because that's what we're doing. Uh, there there are more road uh, resurfacings, there are more integrated rebuilds in order to modernize the, um, uh, the pipes that are underneath the street. It's a lot happening at once. There are still areas, um, I, I have had uh, some significant success at getting various different one-offs on problems we hadn't anticipated, uh, grading issues and sewage issues on a particular street. There's a lot more to be done. The question is how we're going to resource it. All right, thank you very much, Jeff. Una, over to you, same topic, you'll have 60 seconds as well. Well, we're making the problem worse also by hoping that uh, people living in condos and apartments will not need to have cars. This is, you know, it's a great idea if we have the 15-minute city, if we have good access to things like um, car sharing programs. But uh, the reality is a lot of people still have to depend on their cars. And so with intensification, the, the uh, traffic is getting worse. And we need, we need all the measures that, uh, that Jeff referred to. We definitely need more, more uh, police monitoring. We need, uh, we need electronic systems that will automatically ticket and, um, and warn people of the speed they're going. Um, this, the infrastructure of Kitchissippi is really not up to the task of the densification we're experiencing. I know this is a challenge. I hear many people concerned about flooding that's occurred, uh, dangers uh, of more storm sewage uh, breakdowns because of, uh, because of new, infra new buildings. Uh, so we do need to have a plan for that. Thank you very much, Una. Dan, over to you. You have 60 seconds on the same topic. Uh, the city of Ottawa needs to work more closely with Hydro Ottawa. I, I, I know they're not under our immediate control, but we need to negotiate uh, a way for them to protect their basic uh, facilities uh, so that a tree a twig that gets thrown into their uh, equipment doesn't cause a shutdown of electricity uh, in large parts of the city. When the hurricane hit, that kind of thing happened. I, I agree. We need to be far more conscious of the basics. Uh, we need to be paving our streets. We need to be paving the sidewalks. I believe in a walkable city. If you pave the streets, then it's good for the bicyclists, it's good for the pedestrians, and it's good for uh, cars as well. Um, so um, we need to invest in our infrastructure. It's decaying. We've neglected it, and uh, we've neglected it too long. Thank you, Dan. All right, uh, over to Una. You'll start off this one. You'll have 60 seconds for this topic. I believe each of you have touched on this already, and that is the P3 contracts, the public-private partnerships. Some have been successful, some not so successful. Is there a place for them? Is there a benefit to having them? And if so, what are some of those benefits? Uh, of course, if, you're, if you don't believe there are benefits, let us know, know the cons as well. Over to you, uh, Una, for 60. Thanks, Derek. Uh, it's a really important question. The idea of P3s has been around for a few decades now, and Ottawa has had quite some experience with it. I suppose the most catastrophic being the LRT. Uh, they have had some success. And if you look at the Ottawa website, it talks a lot about the, the uh, benefits of doing P3s. And, the, and there are a lot of benefits, but we do need to reassess them, and we have to see, are we really getting the benefits that we hope to get? Because in the case of the LRT, we're, get, we're ending up with litigation, high costs, un, unreliable service, et cetera. There are quite a number of 
SP3s that seem to be successful in Ottawa. They are the smaller ones. Maybe they are more manageable. Uh, but you have to consider how do you do a P3 in a very inflationary times? How do you make a deal that's not going to be detrimental for the city? So what I would like to see is for the uh, government of, of the city to do uh, lessons learned on P3s before thank, we embark on any more. Thank you, Una. Uh, over to you, Dan. Dan, you have 60 seconds. Same topic. I think P3s are inevitable. Uh, they've been controversial, and when they first came in, there was a lot of resistance against them. Uh, the fact is uh, that uh, Ona is correct that um, it's a mixed bag, um, and 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 some parks, for instance, uh, in in the suburbs, have very good experiences, and playgrounds have very good experiences with P3s. Um, and uh, if that works, let's uh, repeat it more because there are certainly some parks in Kitsissippi that could use some help. Um, well, we need our tighter contracts, we need better oversight, and we, we need to learn uh, best practices, absolutely. Um, and and, and we, we sometimes you get the impression the city has been bamboozled by someone who comes in flashing a lot of money, saying they're gonna do a lot of fancy things. Uh, I think we have to look at a new P3 with a jaundiced eye. Thank you very much, Dan. Over to you, Jeff. You have 60 seconds. It's a good question. I think given the experience that the city has had, particularly with LRT, we have to question whether or not the um, uh, the, the risk benefit is, is balanced enough. Um, Many of the negative outcomes of the LRT fiasco have fallen not on the private sector player. They haven't been financial risks to them. It's fallen on riders. It's fallen on riders who aren't able to count on the LRT to get them where they need to go. And our recourse as a city in a public-private partnership is to go to court for financial things. We'll be made whole. We'll force them to fix the LRT. But that doesn't take away the impact that it's had on city transit users. And it's that that offsetting of risk, it is that uh, offloading of risk to the public in non-financial ways that doesn't get captured when we take a look at the balance sheet of P3s. Uh, I am uh, very hesitant to ever get into another one. All right, thank you very much to all of our candidates. It's now time for our closing statements. We'll do that in reverse order. We start with you, Una, you have 60 seconds. Thank you to Rogers, fellow candidates and viewers. Change starts locally. Kitchissippi residents are looking for change. We see the results of eight years with the incumbent councillor. Congested and dangerous roads, poorly signed and unsafe bike paths, construction pits, boarded up houses, streets blocked by construction equipment, lost trees, heat islands, inadequate storm drainage, lack of affordable quality housing, lack of social supports for our diverse community. The incumbent was part of the overall dysfunction at City Hall and therefore was not effective at representing residents. We've seen the lack of understanding, accountability, and action on such important issues as the LRT and the trucker convoy. Business as usual is no longer good enough for Kitchissippi. We need a new councillor with a persuasive voice who will work cooperatively with all members of council to articulate an ambitious, shared vision to make our city vibrant, innovative, and affordable. I bring my experience of leadership on good governance and sustainability to serve all the residents of Kitchissippi and Ottawa. I will work thank, thank diligently you, for you. Thank you very much. Jeff, over to you. You have 60 seconds for your closing. Thanks uh, very much, Derek, and uh, thanks to um, uh, Una and Dan for uh, being here today as well. The, what I've heard this morning is just increases my understanding that we need to have a councillor at the next uh, council who is expert, who is experienced, who is measured, who is transparent, who is communicative. No councillor wins all their battles. Uh, I have been very pleased to collaborate with councillors uh, right around the horseshoe for eight years, and I'm looking forward to continuing that. Uh, I believe that we need to be talking about policies and not personalities, and that's been my approach, and residents know that. You know that through my pop-ups, through my newsletter, that I am constantly engaged in a, a back and forth discussion with you, and that I am accountable for how I vote. I explain those decisions. We have a lot of important work to do in the next term of council. I think it's important to have experience at the table when we Thank do Thank you, it. Jeff. Thank you very much. Dan, over to you. You have 60 seconds for your closing. Thank you. Uh, I will give 25% of my take-home pay as a city councillor to a different local charity every payday. Further, 
I will take my ugly mug off the front page of the Kitsissippi Times three times out of four. You see here where uh, Jeff had both of the earlugs. A little bit insecure is what I thought. Um, so I will, I will offer three out of four of the earlugs that uh, my office would uh, uh, buy from the Kitsissippi Times to a local group to promote their upcoming events. You don't need to look at my ugly face all the time. I think we should recognize Indigenous lands at each council meeting. Um, I think the uh, LRT and the trucker occupation were disasters and the current uh, councillor is complicit. Thank you very much, Dan. Thank you to all of our candidates. Really appreciate your time today, and I, I wish you all the best of luck. Thank you at home for watching. If you want to see some of our other debates, they are available on our website at rogerstv.com. And don't forget, Election Day is October 24th. Thanks so much for tuning in to your local campaign.